Who do I have in front of me at all? Uh, Jim Rees, uh, born and reared here in Ayrclough. And I'm currently the chairman of Ayrclough Maritime Museum. And in the museum, we're expanding it to include other aspects of history here, not just maritime. And uh, what you're doing now, recording the memories of people in the pottery and so on, uh, perfect. That's what's our growing archive as well. And you worked in the pottery? I did. I worked in both of them, as you probably know, there were two sister companies. Uh, the pottery was the original. Our club pottery was the original one. And even the way I pronounce it, you'll hear more. People will say, oh, our club pottery. We know they're not from our club. It's almost if you were to write it down, it's like a pot tree. So it's a pottery. And it was... Uh, so I, I did, and I worked there in the warehouse from 1980, March 1982, until March 1985. But before that, how I got in there, there were two companies. The Pottery was the original, set up in the 1930s, closed in uh, 1998 or 99, depending on who you're talking to. And uh, But from the mid-70s on, a Japanese company set up beside them, Noritake. And where the Pottery was all, later stuff was all out, and where they did porcelain in the early years, but uh, by the time I went in, by the time of the 1960s, 1560s, it was all earthenware, just a normal earthenware that you use. And then the Japanese came in in the 1970s as a porcelain for the high-end market. And I started in Narataki first. In, I went in there on the 2nd of July, 1979. I don't know what it is about me. Dads go in and they stay in. Uh, it's uh, the only good thing I am good at. Estates, married forty-five years, and I'm the one who never forgets an anniversary. But we we won't go there. There was, a, yeah, I went in the second of July, and Narataki was exporting this high level, uh, high high grade porcelain tableware all over to America mainly, Canada, and um, we had. We were shipping through Dallas, we were shipping through San Francisco, Chicago, all this. And then we had the European outlets as well, and we were shipping out there. Um, so it was good. I went in, actually, my job when I went in first was, I was, all, I was always in the dispatch end, the finished goods warehouse end and the dispatch end. I was never in the manufacturing side of it at all. So when I went in, my job was specifically, you would have all the different size boxes for different types of sets and everything else. So you, uh, you had to know all these different types of boxes and the liners and the fillers and all this type of stuff. But my job was mostly with the outside, the container curtains, and I would stencil on what the pattern was, what the set was inside, what the destination was, the port of destination. And it was great. Uh, the lads in the finished goods warehouse would have their dockets. They would load up um, a trolley that they put all the wear on, which would be brought into the packers where I was. There was another guy now, Michael Ford. Michael was in charge. Of, he was between the finished goods warehouse and the dispatch end. That's where all the boxes were. So Michael was in charge of the boxes and he knew every box and every insert that was needed for all the different type of certs. And so Michael would look what was needed from his end. He would bring the boxes down to me. Then the goods would go to the different packers and they'd have a docket. They'd bring their docket up to me and I would have to match their docket to what boxes they want. And it, it sounds complicated and it was in a way, but you, you got into it very quickly and it was good. I have to say, hand on heart, uh, it was num job number four for me in my working career, and it was the first time I realised that you could have a good crack and work. It was, the packing end, that doesn't mean we weren't at each other's throats every so often, but in the packing end, there was a good feel of it. And uh, I have to say, I liked it. I was there for three years, and then there were cutbacks. Uh, the market started to fall away. I hope it was all a coincidence that it started to fall away when I joined. I don't know. <laughs> but one of the things that there is, one of the packers came up with a good crack. 
one time. As I said, we used to stencil right all these boxes, and there could be a hundred boxes. These are going to Dallas, these are going to Chicago, Toronto was another place. And suddenly out of nowhere, we started to get boxes coming in uh, for Iraq. And uh, so the warehouse we had at the time was, oh, we, uh, the pot, uh, uh, Narutaki and the Pottery were renting a warehouse. And um, from Ivanov's company, they were a transport company, and they were renting a warehouse out then. So we were, had all the boxes, Iraq, Iraq, Iraq. And one of the girls showed up, yeah, that's a, a rack open Ivanov's warehouse. Stockpiling had come in, and you can only do that for so long, and then we were laid off. So I was laid off in March 82. But because I knew the dispatch end of it, and because I'd been there for three years and hadn't messed up, my end of it at least, uh, as luck would have it, in the airport pottery warehouse, the job for foreman came up, the foreman left the week before I was due to finish in our attack. But I, there were two different companies, so I had to go through the same application process, do the interviews and everything else, and I got the job as the, the foreman then in the warehouse for the pottery up near the cemetery. And it was three years there, so it was three years in Narataki, then transferred to the Pottery Warehouse. So six years in all. And what, you know, back to the, the, the first three years, were, it, were you packing with cardboard or was it? Packing? Cardboard, yeah. It was all cardboard and the packers were unbelievable. It was piecework. The way I worked, uh, in the packing end, at one side, the busiest time there were upwards of 20 packers. And there were uh, then service people like uh, Michael Ford doing the box, uh, doing getting all the boxes for them, and the inners that the way you divided. The, some things like saucers had individual little boxes and all as well, or maybe you might get six in a little box. But with the sets, the dinner sets, it was like you got long strips of cardboard and you wound them around in certain shapes. And the skills. It took a couple of months for a new packer to really get the skills and they were slow, uh, naturally enough. But my God, when they got in on us, uh, the real experienced Packers were something to watch. And woe betide you, if you didn't, if Michael Ford hadn't got his stuff ready or if I hadn't got the finished cartons ready for them to pack, because they were on piecework. Any delay, they were losing. And so they got their piecework. The good Packers obviously got paid the best because of the piecework. But then the service people like myself and Michael and Tommy Wixford and Tom Kelly and a few others, uh, we, the way we got the bonus was the, all the Packers' bonus on the piecework was uh, what's the average, and we got the average of the Packers. That's the way it was worked. And were they cutting the cardboard to size, or were they already pre-made? Cut they, they pre-made, they were bought in. Uh, because, and look at that, it was great because... Both the pottery and Narataki, where possible, used local suppliers. And right behind where we were in the packing, on the dock road, was Woodfab Limited, the cardboard packaging people. So uh, they were right behind us. All they had to do nearly was bring it around in the forklift, and if I mind getting the lorry, though. So uh, there was that, and sometimes if there was a delay or there was a big push on with us, we might have to go elsewhere for a while. Uh, and uh, you know, But it was great that we were using local stuff. So when we talk about how many people worked in the pottery or in Narataki, uh, you can get the numbers for the two factories, but there's so many ancillary workers as well. It was unbelievable. A massive, massive importance. I know when you were stenciling, um, were you stenciling with a brush? Was it a spray? Roller. Or Rollers. Yeah. Uh, and you'd have the ink in the handle. The hand, and was, roller was about that diameter, about that long, and had a little handle. And you had your ink pad over there every so often. And then you'd have your stencils. And like all stencils, after a while, they'd uh, start falling apart with use. So there's a stencil machine beside you. So as soon as you see one of your stencils coming near an end, an end you cut another one. And you just and you could have, say a packer might be doing 10 sets at a time. So she'd get um, 
she or he, mostly women, I'd say 70-80% would have been female, but there were fellas doing as well. And um, they'd get the, the tray of wear down onto their table, uh, by which time Michael would have had them supplied with the inners. They're like cardboard snakes. And they'd be able to get go and they'd be able to come up and get I should have their cardboard boxes ready then as well. Uh, timing was everything in it and it was just it was just absolutely wonderful. One thing that was dangerous, uh oh, I did the stenciling for eighteen months, but for the second half of my three year period in our uh as I said, there were about 30 people in all between the cardboard and the packing and the dispatch end of it. So there had to be a, a team leader over all that. So the team leader, um, he uh, to change the team leader in March of 81. Yeah, March of 81. And there was two or three of us applied for it and I got his job. So then after a while, I was bringing the trays of goods down to the packers. Somebody else got my job then on the stenciling. But the nightmare was if two, and particularly two good packers, just finished at the same time and you had some sets were easy to pack, some not so easy to pack. And obviously there was a changeover. The last of easy ones was coming down. The first of the hard ones was coming down. And two packers finished at the same time. There was always going to be an argument. He had to call a judgment that you put it into one. And this, I was finished first. I should get that easy one. <laughs> she should get the hard one. And that was... That was the trickiest period to try and keep everyone happy. And you knew at times that you just couldn't, so you had to call a shot. And the compromise was, well, look, next time that situation comes up, you will get... Jesus. But then, of course, by the head came up, you forgot all about it. And you mentioned your pack to being shipped off to Iraq or Dallas. Yeah. Was that by, by boat? No, not from our club. The, um, there was a local transport company. And Ivanovs, and you would lo- they'd come up with the forty foot trailers, you know the uh, tart liners, and so they'd come up and they'd be loaded by our forklift driver Tommy Wixted, and they would head off to Dublin docks or wherever they were going on the ship there, and then they'd go off by ship. Was there? Can you remember any time that it was shipped? Uh, were sh- shipped from Arco at all? Not in my time in Narataki, but. Before that, in our club, Pottery, certainly through the thirties, forties, and fifties, our club, Pottery used to get their uh, clay, the pottery clay, in from Cornwall, and they used to that used to come in on the local boats. Uh, 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 came in from uh, Pool, uh, not Pool, Par, and Foy, that area, of Cornwall and Devon. And funny enough, there were uh, such. Traditional links of sailing links between Arklaw and that part of England. That uh, there are several families who uh, were either Cornish and Devon men or women actually married Arklaw sailors because of such contact. So it's nice to see when the patches started up that that area was getting some business out of it as well. Isn't it interesting as well that link between Arklaw and going to Devon and Cornwall, the maritime links, and also the links between, I suppose, the expertise coming from England originally to set up the factory. Yeah, they came from Stoke-on-Trent, Burslem and Stoke-on-Trent, and in fact, two or three of those experts that came over uh, settled here, and their families are still here. I can think of a few uh, families here now where their grandfather, maybe their great-grandfather at this stage, had come over in the 30s to help set up Marple Pottery. Still to this day? Oh, yeah, the family's still here. Uh, so grands, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. And are, 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 did the surname survive? Yeah, yeah. There's two immediately spring to mind. I won't say it in case I'm wrong. I, I don't think I'm... Uh, but then, and then uh, I don't walk down the street someday and get a box in the nose and say, well, you're not right to be talking about my family. But uh, no, I, there are definitely two. And uh, just and really very nice people. And they're settled in here very well. There's no friction whatsoever. And, um, it's, 
It's weird. The pottery was a strange place. Not a tacky didn't last as long, of course, it was there about 20 years, so it doesn't have the same pull on the heartstrings as the pottery does. Because if you take my family, and this is not exceptional by any means, and I know you've done other interviews, and I'd say one of the things that come out was, uh, it wasn't a question of somebody, oh, do anybody in your family working in the pottery? There were four or five working in the pottery. My father, who was Welsh, actually, but he, not that he came over, uh, my father worked in the pottery for a while. My mother worked in the pottery before, uh, when she left school. Uh, I have three brothers, and I have two brothers, three of us all together. Uh, me and my eldest brother worked in the pottery, and my sister Catherine worked in the pottery. So out of out of six people, there's five working in the pottery at some time or another. And don't if we're going to cousins, we'll be here all day. And how old were you when you started? I'm late. I went in in seventy nine, so I'd have been twenty five. Uh, I'd been working before that, and uh, it's just, it was, I'm not sure why it was. Narataki was a good job, it really was, and uh, that I was working in a production factory where there was machines, and me and machines do not like each other. We never have, we never will. Talk about being paranoid. I used to go into that place on shift work and I knew the machines would start whispering when I went in. Here he is, boys, you you can down tonight. And I wanted to get away from that. And as luck would have it, in 1979, there was a postal strike, I remember. And at the same time, her attack was advertising. It was one of these factories that just kept expanding. And there was a postal strike in July, June, July of 79. And so I'd advertised in the local paper, the Wicklow Paper. And so I went down. They were only across the road. We were in another place, New Plast. And I just went across the road and I got the application form from him, put it in. And uh, as I says, 25 at that time. And, but I got the job and that's when I went in. So. You must have been provided some amount of employment for a town. Hell of a lot. You take it, um, right, there's two production facilities, Arclaw Pottery with the earthenware, Narataki with the porcelain. But they used, as I said, where, when and where they could use local businesses to date. Their main shippers were a local company, Ivanov Transport. They used um, wood fab for a lot of the cardboard, for the boxes and things like that. They used, where possible, local catering company for the canteen. And it was great. It really was uh, a sort of the knowing that, all right, even if you save a few bob by going to an outside factory or an outside company, you might make it on that. But the goodwill and the, the whole thing was there. And the town was absolutely hopping in the late 70s, early 80s. That's what I'm must have been, was it? the weekend must have been hopping, were they? Well, absolutely. And uh, let me do, just do a count on it now. You know the small harbour area, the dock? You'd not a tacky with 600 people in there. Beside that was the pottery with 800 people in there. Behind the pottery, there was Armitage Shanks, uh, the bat room where the people. Uh, they had something like another 100, 120. Newplast had 40 in it at that stage. And so on going around the dock like that, we reckoned there was upwards of 2,000, 2,500 people just in that area, never mind the rest. And Arklaw at that time, the population would have been six, 7,000. So he said, well, where the hell did all these people come from? There were busloads coming in from Wicklow, from Gorey, from Ockram. Uh, this affected, uh, this really gave employment for a 15 mile radius so it's just and you'd obviously the loss is there do you see the loss there now it took a long time uh, it's uh, yeah actually it's easy to argue that it never fully got over it because then uh, IFI NET went to big fertiliser factory that went we've never got back I'm not sure about this actually. I was going to say we never got back to where we were at that time. 
But there is an argument, and somebody was explaining this to me, and I can actually see the logic of it. There are no big signature factories like that in here that we could point to. Oh, yeah, there's 800 in there. But there's lots of light engineering factories. There's lots of computer centres and things building up here now. And actually, so... And we have a population of 14,000. The uh, population is twice the size it was. So I reckon there's far more employed in Airflow now than there was back then. It's just not obvious where they are. That's a really good point. Mm. Yeah. And, uh, sure, people, life, do, like the weekends, like you, you work, did you work Monday to Friday at gym? Monday to Friday, yeah. Did, did, was a factory open Saturday, Sunday? If there was a major rush on, but not necessarily the dispatch, sometimes the production could be. And uh, so it didn't really matter to us. It just meant if we went hell for leather at it to get it out, that we were going to be paid in the piecework and the average piecework that the suppliers were getting as well. So we wouldn't necessarily have to go in and do extra shifts. Sometimes you might be expected. Now, this is in the, in the Narataki end. Sometimes you might be expected to work an hour or two later uh, if there was a big rush on. But other times, up in the warehouse for the pottery after, yeah, it was five o'clock knockoff. But if there was a big rush on, you could be there for seven or eight o'clock. Yeah. And come here. We said some of the families of the English people that come over to the factory, some of their relatives are still yeah. around. Do any of the Japanese families stay or the men stay? No, and the main reason for that, some of them would have loved to. <coughs> the Japanese man I knew that I worked closest with and that I knew best was a fellow called uh, Henry Mayata. Uh, there was always a, a kind of English name put on him. His name wasn't Henry, I just cannot remember. There was another chap I remember, uh, he was Mark. Give you an idea the way the names were allocated. There was a fellow called Mark Mabuchi there. Now, his name was actually Yashikata. He was Yashikata Mabuchi. But they called him Mark because he had been in the German factory for a while, the German Mark. So there was like, so you got a name that suited. And, uh, so Henry was a lovely man. And uh, shortly, be, either shortly before, yeah, shortly before Henry and his wife moved over, they'd had a baby. And Henry loved it here, his wife loved it here as well. But as the child got the school going edge, here for about four years or so, really in Japan under the system, uh, there's the emotional thing it want the child reared in the uh, thing, but it's essentially economically because it has to go through the school system there to really understand the work system there. And if you don't go through the Japanese school system, it's very, very hard to get to develop a career because you're kind of one step removed. And so most of them, if they did have kids, went back to Japan uh, for that reason. Uh, but they would have loved to stay here. The Japanese, I think all of them were golf mad. And I couldn't understand the fact why every one of us weren't down on the golf links at six o'clock in the morning or four o'clock in the morning. Uh, but they were lovely, lovely people. And uh, Henry developed a very Irish sense of humour. He really, he really started. He was the one I think understood his best. And I remember when layoffs started in the spring of '82. Uh, Henry told uh, Henry called Mark Mabuchi over, and Mark would have been Henry's assistant basically. And Henry told him to uh, gather everybody in our end of it. I'm not sure how it was the news spread throughout the rest of the factory. I can only talk about my end. So we were in dispatch, and Henry told Mark to go and break the news to us they're going to be layoffs. So Hen uh, Mark calls us all over and he's very sad and he's very uh, doing it properly. And he says, so somebody says, well, how long have we got? Is it about 10 weeks before the redundancy start. And one of the fellows, he was the team leader in the finished goods warehouse, Tommy Bourne. I remember Tommy immediately saying, 10 weeks, okay. Pound a week from everybody. And we added up with the whole lot. There was, it's going to be about a, a grand in this kitty. So Mark's in the middle looking at this, couldn't figure out what's going on. And uh, so I said, well, Jesus, boys, you'll have one hell of a party. So this really scared Mark. So he went away. And about 10 minutes later, 
Henry comes down with his arm around Mark and he explains to him, he says, Mark thinks you don't understand what's happening, that you're losing your jobs. I've explained to him, the Irish celebrate when they get a job and they celebrate when they lose a job. <laughs> Summed us up. Henry twigged it though. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. Well, I always remember that day, yeah. And we did have one hell of a party. <laughs> And then th- th- those men packed up their families, they all went back within the weeks and months after that, as they did it. Well, that wasn't the closure of the factory. It did carry on then for another 10, 15 years, but this was just one of the periods where they had to let some of the workforce go. It didn't close. But when it, the pottery and all did close, yeah, there was no choice. Uh, they were only working over here. They had to go back home or go to one of the other uh, Narataki factories. There were four or five of them around the world. You see, there's the thing. Why actually Narataki came to Ireland? And it came in the mid-70s. We were only two or three years EU members at the time. We were English-speaking. There was that benefit to it. But I also thought, anybody my age and older would remember, Ireland in the 1970s wasn't 50 years ago. It was 100 years ago economically. No money. Nothing. And you took whatever was going the 60s hadn't been bad. It was a hell of a lot better than the 50s. But it was still bad enough. And in Japan, I'd say somebody was hauled over the calls for this eventually. The Narataki production companies around the world, one was, uh, the main one was in Nagoya in Japan. The, there was one in Colombo in the Philippines. There was one in Sri Lanka. And so all these really poor places and they thought Ireland was the Sri Lanka of Europe and but it was we can get in we can get cheap workers we can uh, we can get this get them in it's the door into Europe as well we have all this market we'll have the benefits of the European market without the benefits of European wages and things like that because Ireland is only starting to develop now so they really thought we were the European Philippines or whatever and somebody definitely got wrapped over the coals. I don't know if this is true or not, but I did hear at the time uh, they got off on a bad foot when they realised, somebody said they hadn't realised that St. Patrick's Day was a bank holiday. And so they said, we don't bank holiday for, for that. So you can imagine how well that went down. <laughs> and it's still a bank holiday. <laughs> so, so, so they had a, sleep, a, a much deeper learning curve on Ireland than they had expected. And why did they pull out? Economy, they really just, uh, both from the pottery side, uh, not attacky. I can, I can say this hand on heart, people might disagree with, with me, but I know I was in the dispatch, I knew what the quality stuff was. When I went in in 79, you could get a perfect piece, whether it's plate, whether a cup or a whole set, and it'd be perfect. But if you turned it around and the back stamp wasn't absolutely centre on the underside, that was the second. That's the quality they did when they went down. Now, within two or three, and we were allowed to buy this stuff, the best stuff for nothing. And uh, within a few years, the quality dropped, but our prices didn't. And you can only do that for so long before the market realises. And I think that might have been one of the aspects. Uh, if you decide right, you're qu- it's too costly, and you drop your quality, then you have to drop your price. You can't be selling second-class stuff for first-class prices. <clears throat> so that was started. But, but then again, you were getting the likes of uh, the Far East coming up. Uh, even when uh, there was no market for high-quality high porcelain and the pottery and the Narataki end of it closed, even after, the pottery could not produce a cup for a price that in the Far East uh, they were producing a 22-piece tea set. And that's what it comes down to, basically. We're just priced out with the market. And are there many homes here in Narco that will have bits of Narataki, bits of... No, there are many homes here in Narco who have sets of Narataki <laughs> and sets of pottery. <laughs> and you can't do anything with them. Nobody wants them. 
because um, we had this experience, I have two daughters, and in, in the early 1980s, I bought two first class, sets, except for that back stamp being wonky, first class sets of uh, Narutaki ware and some pottery stuff as well. I had it in the, um, I had it in the attic and especially got the real good stuff for one for each daughter who ended up. I said, geez, we don't want that. I mean, to work in that. Or you either don't want to use it because it's too good, or if you use it, there's not a lot of clean and all, and you can't put it in the dishwasher. No, we didn't want it. There was one set I remember at the time, Roundelay, was selling about £200. Now, this is back in the 1980s. £200 for a 57-piece dinner set. And now you wouldn't get 50 for it. You wouldn't get 40 for it. Either. So it's just, uh, we, what I did, uh, we went, we were clearing out the attic and <clears throat> any stuff like that, we put it up on, uh, well, a friend of mine did it, I don't know who these work, YouTube, not YouTube, eBay or one of those things. And the money we got from it, uh, we put into the museum instead. We just made a donation to the museum on it. It's the opposite. Yeah, oh, it's lovely and it was worth it. People were scrambling for us. But lifestyles have changed. Uh, people get takeaways. They don't want just ordinary plate of a break, throw it out, whatever. This kind of grand dining and all. And I'm talking about the Narutaki stuff now. That nobody wants that trouble anymore. And so Narutaki, you just wouldn't get anything for. When you mentioned about things breaking, were there any, did you remember in your time there where the, all the contents would, would be dumped? Or is there a dump somewhere? If you took a dig or two, you'd find it. I'm sure, I never indulged in this myself, you understand. I am sure there was a backyard in the pottery. And particularly, when, this is long before Narutaki, I'm talking about late 50s through the 60s. And I don't think there's a house in Arco who ever bought a cup during that period. You know, like that, there might be some, and just thrown. Now they're supposed to be smashed, but you go into stuff in the middle, it's perfect. And of course, as young lad, I know some young people used to get in over the back wall and acquire stuff. I've heard of that on occasion, and I'm sure 99.99999% of young lads heard of it too. <laughs> uh, one thing I will say, this is one of my abiding memories in... Uh, in Narutaki, in the packing end. Uh, I'm trying to think what it would be like. There was a trolley on four wheels and you'd push it uh, and it could be about four foot long by two foot wide, three foot long by two foot wide and there was rollers on the bottom and a wooden piece of plywood as the base and then all the wear was put in on top of that. Uh, there was a clip it was supposed to go on and stop all this rolling off. They're on rollers, for God's sake. So you bring it down to the packer. And if you're very careful, line up, throw it, click the switch, and push with the plywood base onto her rollers. And then she'd be able to reach in and start packing. Uh, and of course, on the outside of that, there was another clip to stop it just rolling off. One day, the, it wasn't me. I said, that was my job for a while. Thankfully, it wasn't on my watch. But one day, uh, there was wear brought down and it was some expensive stuff. And it would have been, it could be ending up to uh, 400 pieces on one of these boards. And your boy forgot to throw the clip on the other. And so, you know one of those things you often see in films where something horrific is going to happen and it's slow motion. I didn't think it happened in real life. Well, yes, it does. It out over the edge. I don't know how much money is worth. Now everyone is just. This was a, a major deal. It was an oversight by the person who brought the wear, and it had nothing to do with the packer. But the packer, unfortunately, was a girl who not too long in the place, and she thought it was her fault, and she got really panicky. So everyone's calming her down. It was very supportive less walking, I have to say. But as it happens in such situations, who walks around the corner only the 
managing director and two of his department managers. And they were there just to see it hit the floor and hear the crash. And the managing director, to his eternal credit, I, I didn't particularly like him, but uh, to his eternal credit that day, the girl started giggling, that was pure nervous reaction, just giggling, she couldn't stop. And he went over and he said to her, looking at this man, tell me, my dear, you get your cheque, and it was all, you were paid by cheque of a at that time, not into the bank, like you just got a physical cheque, pay a packet. And he, when you get your cheque on Thursday, if I come down and ask you for that cheque, and I tear it into a thousand little pieces, would you laugh then? And she said no, and she's still laughing. She said no. And he said, well, don't laugh now. And he just walked away, and that was it. But instead of losing the head, it was one of those things. But I always remember that big smash, and that was a smash. <laughs> yes. It's a nice little memory. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. And you were... After 18 months, he got moved then into the head... head, head yeah. Head. Uh, oh. There was a manager over Georgie English. Georgie died there recently, but Georgie was a great fellow to work for. Uh, there was the canteen in the middle of the floor, the packing end, the finished goods warehouse, and, the, and then the, where the cardboard was, and then the packing end of it uh, was a big open space, and our canteen... Uh, was smack in the middle of the floor. And the manager's office, that area the manager's office was on top of that, so he could see the packing end right around to the, not sorry, the finished goods warehouse right around to the dispatch door. And Georgie English was the manager over that area. And then Tommy Bourne was the team leader over uh, on the ground uh, in the finished goods warehouse. And then I was the team leader in the packing. And uh, it was just, that, and that's the way it was structured. And we'd always work something between, if there was a problem, you'd just get in, sort it. Uh, no delays for anything. And particularly, not so much because you're worried about the management, you're worried about the packers losing money, standing by and the thing. And we, we did just work it very well. And Georgie was great in that... Um, no matter what the situation was, he never panicked. Yeah. Let's get this sorted out first and look for blame after if we have to. And that's the way it worked. That was that. And, uh, sorry, what was the question? Or the... No, you just you, you moved on to that role. Yeah. And, yeah, and that you were there for, you were in that role for... For um, about 12 months 12 until... Months. Yeah. yeah. And actually, you mentioned there about the work environment, said it was very supportive. Like, you had a canteen. Um, but what was, it, what was, it, what, what, what was your, your average day like? When would you start? When you were in the first three years, I'm trying to think now. The up in the warehouse after was oh no, eight o'clock down in Narataki was eight o'clock to half four, and then uh, actually kind of got me into trouble with the neighbour. Is when I moved up to the pottery, that was from half eight to five o'clock. Now there's a neighbour directly across from me. He's dead now, but he used to, didn't start work until nine o'clock in the morning. So I used to. Wait to hear me going. No, he used to start work at half eight where he was. He didn't work in the pottery or anything. He was on the buildings and he started half eight. And he used to wait to hear me going out in the morning at about ten to eight. And then he knew it was for him time to get up and go to work. But sure, I never bothered telling him. I didn't feel I had to report anyway, but I never bothered telling him that I'd moved up to the warehouse where I didn't start till half eight now. And so he heard me going out one morning and he woke up and said, that's great, I better get up. And here it is, 20 past that. <laughs> so he gave out to me about that for years. It was happened the first week he was caught. Well, that's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant. And were your father working there as well? No, he was working there in the 40s and uh, he moved on to something else after. None of us were in it for very long. Uh, neither my father. Uh, my mother started in 19... 34 in there and then she moved and she uh, did training as a nurse over in Birmingham uh, so she was there for the first four years at the pottery and then my father was in it late 40s very early 50s for about four years and then Brian was in it in the 60s and early 70s 
and they was late seventies, early eighties. So your mother was there the first in the thirties. Oh yeah, she was one. She was born in nineteen nineteen. So she was 15 when it opened, when the sod was turned in 1934, and then 16 when it opened in 35, so she was one of the first then. Serious? Yeah. What was her name? Una. Una Turtle, she was then. And then met me. She went over to England nursing then, and my father was Welsh, and he was working in Austin Car Works in Birmingham, and actually the two of them met in Birmingham, but after the war they came back here. That's the start of the line of yours around here. Uh, of, of the recent of it, but on my mother's side, the uh, turds, uh, I can trace in a direct line, I can trace the tur my line of turds back to 1690 here. So. That's, uh, I was good. I, I have to say, uh, Narataki was job number four for me. It was the first time I realised you could have a crack and not dread every single minute in the place. Did you have to wear a uniform? Yeah, but they were nice, and uh, I, I quite liked it. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone objected, but I'd been not, uh, other jobs where I had to wear my ordinary war, no clothes at the time. And it was nice. It was uh, <clears throat> maybe some of the places into maintenance, maybe there would have been the one-piece uniform. But the ones we had were trousers and jacket, and were nicely cut and all. I was never a fashion slave, you know, but I mean, I thought they were all right. And when did you get paid? And what day did you get paid? Can't remember. Uh, my wife would be able to tell you that because I never saw the wedge packet long enough to remember what day it was. <laughs> so I kind of went, oh, thanks. Oh, Jesus, that didn't last long. <laughs> and was it cash or check? Checking or attacky, I, I remember. And all, yeah, the uh, previous jobs it had it was cash. So you know that he had changed in it as well, but then it was a uh, check. In, and I'm not sure when, the, obviously they went to direct lodgements into account after, I'm not sure. That would have been after my time. But yeah, let me see, what did I do after? This, the three years in the Narataki, then the Pottery Warehouse, and after that I just had a succession of jobs, you name it. So I think I've done it at one stage or another. Tell me about the Pottery Warehouse. So you went from North Hackney to the Pottery Warehouse. Yeah. Um, what were you doing there? Again, I went up as foreman and it was Egon Turkelson was the warehouse manager. And then I was the foreman out and there was four of us actually on the floor. So there were three fellas out there with me. And basically this pottery salesman would be travelling all over the country. They'd get their orders and the orders would come in. Then the orders would be, the offices were upstairs, so uh, there's Mary Kyo and several others up in the offices uh, did that. And after a day or two, when all the admin had been done, uh, Egon had come out with our orders to be filled that day. So we'd get all the stuff ready, and then at the end of the day, when it, we'd have everything finished for that load, uh, you could have, you do it in a, on a regional basis, you could have 10 shops, say Donegal, Leitrim, uh, today, could be Kerry Cork tomorrow, and you would do it regionally, and you would have the loads ready for each run, and then again be Ivanos Transport had come, and they just distributed around the country then. The difference between Narataki, what I was doing in Narataki, and the pottery warehouse, Narataki stuff was being shipped out to Toronto, Chicago, wherever. But uh, the shipping we did from the pottery warehouse was all in Ireland. And what were they going in for? Different containers or much smaller? Just Depend on the load, but usually, uh, God, for a good while, you would have a 40 foot container and uh, maybe a small van as well. Uh, there was one small van dedicated to covering the Dublin area. They had got likes of Brown Thomas and uh, the rest of them. Uh, Cleary's was a big customer. And so th that would go there. Dennis Nocter used to drive for Ivanos and that. But, but the way we would get it up, how we, so that's how we emptied the warehouse, the stuff going out of the warehouse. How we get it in was uh, down in the pottery, 
you'd have all the stuff coming off the production end, naturally enough, and then that'd be boxed into maybe a hundred cups, two hundred saucers, whatever. And they had a small warehouse there, little holding area. And so each day's production and all the boxes would be held there, and then they would bring it up by lorry up to us to the big warehouse. But we had, at any given time in the big warehouse, we could, I think the average was 1.2 million pieces. So it was big, it was, it was constant. And there was only four of us actually working in the warehouse, me and three of the lads. And you weren't producing for demand, and you, you, you weren't hitting orders, you were just producing the well, same stuff. That's what, if, you're, if you have a production unit that works in a big way where you're produced, you cannot produce on demand because just say there's no demand, then you can't stop all the machines. And all. This is exactly what's happened with the airports. When the demand at the airport stopped, all the experienced workers were laid off. Now they can't replace them. That's what would have happened with a production company. So in the slack period of selling, you still, if you can knock back your production a bit, well and good, but you still have to produce. And uh, so that goes into the storeroom then until uh, the sales pick up again. So were there, was there transport leaving Arklow five days a week going around the country? Oh yeah, yeah. Leaving the pottery? Yeah, it would have been. Every county, 32 counties in the country? Up north? Uh, up north as well, yeah. Yeah, we covered the uh, 32 counties. Uh, I don't remember any, I might be wrong on this, but certainly in my time, I don't remember any going uh, across to Britain. But uh, the 32 counties we covered. And it, yeah, it was good. It was, that warehouse was without doubt the coldest place I've ever worked. I'll tell you how bad it was. And I've worked in lots of different environments, but that warehouse. I need the lads to tell you this it was one year I remember uh, one end of the warehouse there was a leak in it and so I had a few days rain and there was a big puddle in it for a few days and then the temperature dropped it was really cold winter I think it was that must have been uh, around 83 84 and that pool and it was about 30 feet across now it was only about a quarter of an inch deep but that froze over and that was still there at Easter. It was down in the corner of that warehouse. We didn't have to go, so the forklifts and all weren't going over it. But that pool was just down there. It was the coldest spot. And it's the first time I ever wore the gloves with no fingers. Uh, because if you had fingers, you couldn't wear gloves when you were up in the rack and, and you're lifting heavy crates, you know, 52 piece dinners, or maybe 100 saucers and something. You have to have your fingers. Even if they're blue, you still have to have them free so you can feel the bloody thing. But that, that was cold. And was there a kind of a canteen where you could go get a cup of tea or coffee? Yeah, we had a small canteen. That was fine. And in fact, the one thing I liked about uh, Narutaki, uh, the way the Japanese ran it, and with the pottery as well, uh, with the pottery warehouse, it didn't matter if you, when it came to the 10 o'clock break or whatever in the morning, you could be sitting at the table with the manager or the salesman. It didn't matter if you were uh, up in the office, out on the forklift, whatever. Everyone's in the same space. And, and the only reason, if there was any segregation, it was voluntary in so much as you tend to sit down with the fellows you're actually working with, but that's all it was. So there was never any sense of, I'm me, hey, you're down there. I never got it anyway. I wouldn't have taken it anyway, but... <laughs> And was there a social fund for you to go out in the evenings or anything like that? No, no, not really. Uh, I suppose if you you could say, yeah, to a certain extent, for many people, it usually would just call them pubs. <laughs> um, uh, no, there was no set social club or anything like that. At one stage, again, I think before my time, <clears throat> to my, my, I think I heard all the people talking about annual outings to places, something like that. That's as near as you got to uh, social. What every, every place did at that time, back in the 70s, I said back to the 40s, there was the annual dinner dance Tuesday around Christmas. Yeah. But only, one of the other things we used to do, uh, Narutaki and the pottery, uh, 
the local soccer club here at Arkle Town used to run seven aside competitions in the summer. If you put a team together, then uh, they would buy the the company would buy the kiss for you. Are there any is that any of that stuff surviving with North Hockey on them on the jerseys or any of that kind of crap? There has to be. Um, a brother of mine who was very much Brian uh, had been in the past few years ago, but uh, he and Jackie Doyle wrote in 1998, uh, Arkle Town was 50 years old, so they collected all memorabilia and they wrote a book about the history of that 50 years. So I'm sure the lads would have come across some of the Narataki teams and all that type of thing. Georgie English, as a, who unfortunately died there what, a couple of months ago, uh, Georgie had a wonderful collection of memorabilia. I don't know if he still has it, but I do remember 20, 25 years ago, um, they put on an exhibition up in the Marlborough Hall here in the town, and Georgie had wonderful stuff in there. Going back to the start, probably. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Did your mother talk much about the early days to you? Only in as much she couldn't wait to get out of it. <laughs> and to be honest, uh, she said no, she knew when she went, because there's nothing else in the town. She went in there, and it's what confirmed her uh, that, no, she was going to get some kind of training in some profession. And as I said, she became a nurse during the war in England. And, uh, but she'd no, she loved the people. She was working with, don't get me wrong, but the place was the most higgledy, piggledy little place that had abs- personally, uh, people that castigate me for this, I'm speaking personally, or was the drabbest, most r- rabbit warren little hole I've ever worked in. And I have absolutely no sentiment for the pottery whatsoever, I- except again the people I worked with. But the place itself, it was built in the 1930s and it could have been built in the 1730s. It was terrible. One, it was, it was so higgledy piggledy. It was all pre pre forklift and things like that. So they had the doors between different departments were basically normal sized doors, maybe slightly wider, but not much. So they had their own little pallets that you went around from one place to another with, with the pallet truck. Uh, but by the time they came up to our warehouse, we were using the modern pallets, modern rack, and it could be used. Everything had to be. I mean, the costs in that, everything was double handling. Because we had to take them off. And we tried to use a shortcut with it one day by just lifting the pottery pallets onto the standard pallet. And health and safety officer came in one day. We had the racks for a good few days. And, no, not having that. They said you have to hand stack all them onto the proper pallet. Why, I don't know, because it was perfectly safe on the wider pallet. But it was just, put it this way, if Alice would have fallen down to the rabbit hole, she would have ended up in the pottery, as far as I can. I, I, I've no, sim, no great graph for it at all. Um, just acknowledge what it did, and a lot of people got their living out of it. But I'm just talking about the place, not, not the experience. You know when the when it was uh, all taken down, mm. Jim, where did all like the machinery go? And did it, was it recycled or upcycled or? Well, the one thing I like the pub nearest to Pottery, the Harbour Bar in Lower Main Street, that was getting refurbished. And, uh, the whole layout was changed around, and you can actually see. I'm not sure if you can see it now, but when they redid the bar, they got some of the old boards that. Uh, in the clay end or the mall makers end they used to use long boards and that was all chalk and you can see that they got some of them to do the bar top and it was lovely you could see the scrapings of generations of clay on it and i mean it, it was all dry it was into the wood it didn't come off any or anything like that uh, and it was just i thought it was a lovely touch anything else any, any of the machinery did it get sold on or what we have in the museum, <clears throat> um, we have the old clock, the, the car clock. Now, be- from 1895 until 1920, we had a munitions factory here called Kynox. 
And actually, that clause in 1920, the pottery opened 15 years later. Uh, but somebody must have held on to this clock because that was used in the pottery for the, uh, from 1935 up to about 1970 when it was replaced by a new clock and in system. But, um, so we have a sample of that old, we have that old clock, but we also have a piece of the new clock and in system as well in the museum. That's an interesting link that you made with Kynock there. When that yeah. left out, actually, left a, that left a vacuum as well, I'd say. Absolutely. Uh, in many ways, the pottery was the new Kynox. And um, because the numbers that employed... But nowhere near Kynox had 4,000 people working in it in the First World War. But the pottery was over eight or 900 people uh, at its height. And there is, I fully understand people talking about it nostalgically and everything else because there was an awful lot, this town would have gone belly up so often without the pottery in the 30s, 40s, 50s. And uh, so that uh, has to be acknowledged, but pity it wasn't a bit brighter place to walk in. I do know what we do have is... <clears throat> We have very little in the museum on it, so we like to appeal to people. Photographs, videos. Somebody videoed the last 24 hours in the place, a complete day, which is, which is lovely and wouldn't be without it. But it's, it's false in as much that everybody knew it was the last day. It'd be lovely if there was a video of a normal working day. Uh, but there is stuff like that, and really that's why I love to see this archive being built. Uh, this is far more important. I think the, the talk about the Pottery Museum, and I see why people would like the Pottery Museum, but I would much prefer to see <coughs> a pottery presence in a town museum. I've never even agreed with an Arclaw Maritime Museum. I think there should be an Arclaw Museum. And uh, because... To be honest, if they go to the trouble and expense of building a new museum specifically for the pottery, no matter how nostalgic it might be, no matter how lovely the wear might be, you can only go in and see so many cups and saucers. I personally haven't been minding 1.2 million of them at different times. I never want to see another one again. <laughs> but it's a great idea, but that's why this archive to me is by far the most important aspect of this whole project.